How are you doing? Um, so, I was wondering, do you think it's a fundamental necessity for one to call oneself a Christian or to ascribe to any religion if they do live a life that the life that Jesus proposed, one lives with love, if one lives impersonally egoless and cares for, loves God and loves their neighbor, must one have to call themselves a Christian or ascribe to the dogmatic or Christian, Christian proper beliefs in order to live such a good life? I appreciate that. And in your question, there are two or three. It's a very good question. There is a sequence in the Christian faith that is very unique, again. The sequence is this, redemption, righteousness, and worship. It's not just logical, it's chronological. You cannot alter that sequence. In other words, righteousness is never talked about until one is first redeemed. And worship is never enjoined until one is redeemed and righteous. For who shall ascend to the hill of the Lord but he that has clean hands and a pure heart? You know, I saw an astounding article in, uh, I think it was in the Daily Mirror or the Times of London, by a renowned atheistic journalist by the name of Matthew Parrish. Brilliant article. He was a resident of Africa for many years and is an avowed atheist and in his lifestyle holds to completely different values to what I would hold. But he wrote an article, if you actually log on his name and try to get that article on his ideas of redeeming and what goes on in some of the parts of Africa which he loved so dearly, he said, I have come to a conclusion that staggers me. He said the impact of the missionaries with their message of Jesus Christ in its redemptive foundation seems to be the only thing that has effectively worked in order to change the hearts of some against the other in their, in, their, in their antipathy and hostility to each other. He said, now some of you may say to me, why can't I go and just preach goodness and preach morality? Matthew Paris said this, the redemptive aspect of it seems indispensable to the transformation of this. He said, I find myself surprising myself in having to say this. Now what he is enjoining is very real. The hunger of your heart must change and that hunger is not merely to do good things. The first thing you recognize is the need for forgiveness from God himself and the need for that savior. I remember being in Cambodia and I won't go into the details. The last night of my time there when the whole city and country was under curfew and my interpreter, who wasn't a follower of Christ, had been interpreting for me, and we saw a play in which good is trumped and evil triumphs, and the powers of government override the ordinary peasant, breaking their lives and shattering them. I didn't like the end of that play, which we saw together. And as I was walking away from there, I said, he said to me, what do you think of this play? I said, beautifully done, but I don't like the ending. He stopped in the middle of the road. We were walking past curfew. He said, Mr. Zacharias, the reason you probably didn't like it is because you probably didn't connect with the story. He said, that is the story of my nation. We, as farmers and peasants and ordinary people, have been slaughtered and had everything taken away, and we have nothing with which to fight back. At this point, Cambodia had barely opened. I said, what do you think is the answer? He said, we need a savior, and we don't have any. And so I say to you, your, your desire to lead a good life, to love, to be benevolent, and all of that is wonderful. But the source of that is in the person of God himself who gives you that absolute, and it always starts by forgiveness, and that's what leads to redemption, then to righteousness, and then to worship. That's the chronological sequence and the logical sequence in the answers of Christ.